Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Tell your neighbor Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We are excited about getting into the portion today of Parshat Hukat. And so we are going to take a look at this wonderful message today that really speaks so much about Messiah. There's so many allusions to Messiah. We can only talk about so much. And so we're looking at a message today called, What's on the Menu? Manna? Yeah. Ask your neighbor, what's on the menu? <laughs> it's interesting, the word menu actually comes from a word that means to kind of portion out or, or details of what's going to be eaten. And you can think about the manna also. It sounds like a menu, doesn't it? Menu, manna. It, it, it refers to a portioning out of things. And uh, it asks the question, what is this? So we're going to take a look at this message today. What's on the menu? Manna? And so we say welcome and hearty team Habaim to all of our first time guests in the house today. We're glad that you have come. And uh, we pray that you are having a peaceful Sabbath today. How many are having the peace of the Sabbath today? Amen. 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 Shalom Aleichem. And uh, we're going to get ready, in, ready for 10 minutes of Torah. How many are ready today? Yes. All right. Let's take a look at our Torah portion. It's Starts with Be Midbar, Numbers 19, 1 through 22, 1. We also heard the prophet reading Shoftim, or Judges uh, 2, 1 uh, through 24, is the reading. And then Yohanan, or John 3, 9 through 21. So let's take a look at Numbers 19, 1, and see how the Torah begins in the TLV, Tree of Life version. It says, Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aharon, saying, This is the statute, or in Hebrew, Hukat. Can you say Hukat? Uh, not who caught who, but you know, who caught, uh, which is a divine decree of the Torah. Verse 6 says, The Kohen is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool and cast them into the midst of a burning heifer. Verse 9 says, A clean man is to gather up the ashes of the heifer and put them in a clean place outside the camp. They are to be for the community of Ben Israel to use for water of purification for sin. Now, in juxtaposition to this, there is a reference made to touching the dead. And Miriam dies this week, and the Israelites complain right in the next verse. It says they complain that there was no water. It doesn't say they mourned. It doesn't say they wept like they did for Moses and Aaron. How many know this was their female leader of the camp? This was the sister of Moses and Aaron. How could they not mourn but complain? You see, sometimes we need to mourn more than complain. We need to mourn over our sin, our circumstances, our situations, so we can get a solution to why they happened and figure out how they cannot happen again. Instead of complaining of, why is this happening to me? Oy vey, woe is me. It's always happening to me. I'm the victim. But if you're going to rise up and be a victor, you can no longer just complain. You need to mourn over your sin, mourn over your situation, mourn over the loss of loved ones, and then be able to healthfully move on from that. And so you know in a healthy way there's a great... Uh, concept in mourning the death even of a loved one so that you don't have to mourn for the rest of your life but you'll always remember if you mourn properly you'll be able to remember as a reminder of who that person was in your life what impact they played and instead of thinking of all the negative that you could complain about you think of all the positives that you can glean from and learn about amen, amen. so let's take a look at how this relates to chapter 20 uh, in re a relationship to the death of Miriam and the lack of water. The rabbis say, well, they didn't shed tears for Miriam, so the water dried up. How I many know if we don't let the tears flow, sometimes the water will dry up, the resources will dry up. We need to sometimes allow the tears to flow, allow the fountain to keep producing. You know, the I is, the Hebrew word ein, is the word used for fountain. So if you think about the fountain, it is actually an eye in the landscape that gives out water. So when you're looking down at it from God's perspective, it looks like a little eye. And when it gives off water, it's crying. And so you think about how eye is used for, eye is used for fountain, and eye is used for the eye of the body. You can see that it, there's some kind of connection here. As it says in verse 1, in the first month, the entire community of Ben Israel arrived at the wilderness of Zin. The people stayed at Kadesh, there Miriam died and was buried. Verse 2 immediately says, now that there was no water in the community. Now, re let me read it again. There Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community. 
It's as if the rabbis see in the text that they're making a connection to the merit of the water to Miriam, who brought them through the Sea of Reeds, and they rejoiced when the water was on either side, and through her praise of tambourine players and singers and worshipers, she led a mighty worship in Israel that as long as people were praising God and worshiping, that God brought us out of Egypt, God brought us through the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, God brought us through this dry desert, He will provide water for a rock. All we've got to do is speak to the rock, all we've got to do is sing, spring up a well, and water will come forth. Guess who was the leader of the praisers? Before there was a priesthood of Levites to praise God. There was the women that worshipped. Not just women that learn how to weep, but women that learn how to worship. Not just women that know how to worry, but women that know how to worship. Do we have any worshiping women in the house? Do we have any wailing women that know how to pray and intercede for their families? That's what kept the community going. It's funny how life comes through a woman. And the life of Messiah came through a woman. Born under the Sinai covenant, the law, born of a woman. So it's interesting how Miriam plays a great role. She was the one that saved the life of her brother Moses. It was Miriam that was the one to tell the, the daughter of Pharaoh, oh, you need a good mother to take care of this child, don't you? It's a Hebrew child. Guess what? You need a good Hebrew mother. I got just the perfect person for you. I know who could be the, the, the nanny. And it turns out to be mom herself, right? What a great thing it was for Aaron, I mean, and uh, Moses um, to grow up not only in that culture, but to be able to grow up together. Because even though Moses was a part of Pharaoh's house, he was still a part of a Hebrew house. Amen. See, sometimes we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. And we've got to realize our roots and come back to our roots and who we are instead of just, you know, being out there in the world and just thinking, well, well we're, we're out there for a reason, but sometimes you forget the reason. Amen. I said, sometimes you forget the reason. Amen. What, why, did, why did, what am I doing over here? What, what is, what's the, and questions come up. But instead of complaining, let's mourn properly and let's move beyond that place and let's see the water come up again. Amen? Amen. Look what it says in verse number three. The people quarreled with Moses saying, didn't they always? If we had died when our brothers died before Adonai, now why have you brought the community of Adonai into this wilderness for us and our livestock die here? So notice they had this victim mentality that you see uh, it continues on. In verse number five it says, Why have you brought us from Egypt to bring us to this evil place, a place without grain, fig, grapevine, or pomegranate, and there's no water to drink? So Moses and Aaron went from before the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of Adonai appeared to them. You know what I love? I love the fact that Moses and Aaron didn't get offended. Instead of getting offended, they found their offense. Their offense was to go to a God who also could be their defense. Instead of defending themselves, they went to the God who protected them and kept them. They went to the tent of meeting. They fell and humbled themselves on their faces before the Lord, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Wow, it's beautiful. Verse 7 says, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and gather the assembly, you and your brother Aaron. Speak to the rock. I love this. Speak to the rock. The word rock in Hebrew is selah. But it does say speak to the rock. So actually in Hebrew it's ha selah. Ha selah. So the rabbis say, why does it say the rock and not a rock? Speak to any rock. Mm. It's almost like they knew the rock that was supposed to give the water, but it wasn't giving water that day anymore. So they said, speak to the rock. Yeah. How many know all we need to do is speak to the rock? Yeah. The rock that is higher than I, and that rock is going to provide when we ask. Yeah. In the beginning of Moses' ministry, he had to strike the rock at the command of the Lord. Because the rock was only to be struck once. Yeah. Mm. And if the rock is Messiah, mm -hmm. then he's not to be struck twice. He's to be struck once. So once he's been smitten, stricken by God, they say, Isaiah 53, that's once and for all. Therefore, we don't need to have Messiah die again or be the rock that is struck again. All we need to do is speak to the rock. 
See, he's already the rock of our salvation, but he was the rock that was rejected by men. And he's to be the chief cornerstone of the building that God is building for himself a house. He was already rejected. Let's not reject him again. You know what happens when we try to fix our problems on our own? Yeah. We're rejecting the rock from which we've been healed. We're rejecting the source of our water. We're rejecting the provision. And I love the fact that Moses was told, all you have to do is just speak to the rock. You see, if the price has already been paid for for our salvation and our healing and our deliverance, all we need to do is just speak to the rock. Mm -hmm. And the rock will produce what we need. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will give out its water. You will bring out water from the rock, and you will give the community something to drink along with their livestock. Now, I want you to notice that everything that Israel went through was a test. Because not only did they complain for water, but they also complained that they didn't have any what? Any bread, and they complained that they didn't have any meat. Look at what Exodus 16.4 says in reference to God's provision. It says, Then Adonai said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from where? Heaven for you. Who said he'll rain it? Adonai did. God said, I'll rain down bread from heaven. No, so the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven. Not you, Moses. Moses, you're not the provider. I am. How many know when people come to you for prayer? You're the prayer warrior, but you're not the provider. Amen. God is the provider. You have to trust him like they have to trust him. And you've got to come in agreement where two or three are gathered in his name to believe God for the provision, but you're not the provider. And you can't, they can't come to you and say, hey, the prayer didn't work, you didn't do it right, do it again, or, and, and want their money back because they didn't pay you to pray. It was free of charge. It's a free gift. Amen? Amen. And so you've got to trust the giver of the gift, even when you have a gift. If I have a gift to pray, to intercede, if I have a gift of the Spirit, I have to trust the giver of the gift that gave me the gift because I'm not the source of the gift. I use the gift for His glory, but the gift is not for me. It's for somebody else that I've been gifted for. And so I have to trust the giver just as they had to trust the giver. God is the one that gave the bread just like God gave the Torah. Now look at the connection. Look what it says. Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's what? Portion. Their day's menu. Uh, every day. So that I can test them to find out whether they will walk according to my Torah or not. So wait a minute. Gathering the manna is like gathering the Torah. Eating the manna is like eating the Torah. And following the instruction concerning the manna is like following the instruction of the, the Torah. Amen. Amen. So there's something closely related to the man on the Torah. Sure. Because the Torah came from heaven. Right. And the manna came from heaven. Yes. Right? Yes. Didn't get the Torah come from heaven? Yes. A voice from heaven after a heavenly shofar began to speak the words, the ten words of the Torah, of the covenant. And at Mount Sinai, God, God gave his Torah audibly as oracles of God. The first principles of the oracles of God before they were ever written down. They were oral before they were written. That's why rabbis talk about an oral Torah and a written Torah. It is actually very needed to have oral instruction. Now, take a look at Deuteronomy 8.1 in comparison to the beginning of Moses' ministry and now the closing out of Moses' ministry 40 years later. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the most quoted book by Yeshua the Messiah himself. In Deuteronomy 8.1, it says, You are to take care to do the whole mitzvah, not half of it, not part of it, all of it. Right. Don't love me with half of your heart, love me with all of your heart. Not just with your heart, love me with your soul. Not just with your soul, love me with all your strength, your body. Love me spirit, soul, and body because if you're going to love me, love me with all of you because I want all of you, I don't want half of you. Right. I don't want part of you, I want all of you. Yeah. And it's like in a marriage. You can't say you love with words and not love with action. Right. You can't love in thought only. Well, I, I thought you knew that I loved you. Well, you haven't shown it in a while, so I haven't thought those thoughts lately because I haven't seen any action to go along with those thoughts, to go along with those words that you've been saying right now. I mean, oh, God wants all of us just like a spouse wants all of us. Yes. I mean, if I'm talking to my spouse and she's looking somewhere else or staring at her, her iPad, I'm going to be thinking that she's not listening. Right. I, did you hear what I said? Oh, yeah, 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 hold on. I'm just checking Facebook right now. Well, wait a minute. 
And she might be saying that to me, but guess what? We have to sit down and talk eye to eye, face to face, like Moses talked to God, because he wants a real relationship with us. He doesn't want just rules and regulations. Right. He wants a real relationship. Take a look at uh, verse 2. You are to remember all the way that Adonai, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. How many years has it been? 40, 40 years. So at the beginning of 40 years, he gave this command about the manna. And now here's the end of the 40 years. Look what it says. In order to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his meets vote or not. Sounds like exactly what we read in Exodus 16, doesn't it? Look what it says in verse number 3. It says, he afflicted you and let you hunger. Then he fed you with what? Manna. manna in Hebrew, man. And that in Greek, it gets uh, an extra A added to it, so we say mana, mana. So manna uh, is what he fed you with, which neither you nor your fathers had known, because the word mana or manna comes from the Hebrew phrase manhu, which is... Uh, Manhu means manna it is. It's manna. And then the next statement they said, Mahu. What is it? So Manhu, manna it is, means Mahu. Well, what is it? <laughs> so it's a play on words. Manhu, this is manna. And in the next part of the phrase, Mahu. What is this? Actually, who could be he or it? So we see that he says, what, what is this? What is he? What is it? You know, it doesn't have any uh, meaning to me. So notice that the Torah that we don't understand is like manhu. Right. Here it is. Here's the manna, but we don't understand it. Right. Here's the Torah. We read it, but we don't understand it. Yep. The Torah you read that you don't understand is not manna. Mm -hmm. sure. Because manna is something you taste and see that the Lord is good. You get a revelation of it because you've tasted that it's like not just, uh, what's this horrible manna? on the ground. No, it's something that you processed and assimilated to your life. And when you taste it, you say, wow, it tastes like honey cakes. Right. How did it go from this nasty stuff on the ground to, boy, it tastes so sweet. I want more of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, the day's portion is over. You got to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> and if you eat sweets all day long, you'll be messed up. So God gives you a little sweet with your meal, a little honey on your cake, just so it'll be sweet to you. But look what it says. It says, uh, which neither... Uh, you nor your fathers had known, meaning understood, because they asked, what is it? In order to make you understand that man shall, does not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Where have I heard that from? Wow. And then lastly, look at this. Deuteronomy 32, 1 says, give ear, uh, Moses said, give ear, O heavens. Where does the Torah come from? Heaven. And I will speak. How did God give the Torah? He spoke. So Moses is speaking because God spoke the Torah. Moses is speaking the Torah because he's the mouthpiece of God. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching trickle like rain. What did he say he was going to send? Manna. But he was going to rain down bread from heaven. So as the rain comes down like the Torah comes down, the bread comes down because the Torah is the bread. Right? I tested you with manna because I'm testing you with the Torah. Now, my last uh, couple of thoughts here comes from Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, for this Torah part. The grumblers among them began to have cravings. Don't the grumblers always have cravings? So B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, began to wail repeatedly, saying, If we could just eat some meat. We remember the fish that we used to eat in Egypt for free. For free, that's called slave food. It's not, it's not for free. You're working for it. You're a slave. Oh, we were getting this stuff for free. It's funny how people always want the milk for free, huh? True. <laughs> Instead of paying the, of the, paying the price of that heifer. <laughs> that cow, that red heifer. You've got to pay the price because if you want the milk, you want, you're going to have to purchase the... Uh, 
the animal that gives the milk. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. When was the last time you said, oh, I remember the days we used to just have garlic like all day long? <laughs> just onions, I just smell. You know they say you're a good cook, you smell like a good cook if you just cook onions all day. Yeah. Cook onions all day, people say, oh, what's cooking in here? Oh, just onions. Yeah. Onions? What are we gonna do with onions? I can't eat, eat just onions. Onions are to flavor food, but it's almost like they have amnesia. They forgot what it was like to be a slave but all of a sudden, they were like these kings eating leeks and garlic. <laughs> this is slave food. Now, garlic is good, but it needs to be on some meat. So they didn't even have meat, they had fish. But they're romanticizing their past, as we often do. Oh, I remember back in the day when we used to do this. And you really think about back in the day? You hated that day, that's why you, you hated it. Look what it says in verse 6. But now we have no appetite. We're complaining about something that we don't even want anymore. Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? But now I'm complaining so much, I don't even, I've lost my appetite. Look what it says. We, but now we have no appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Meaning we're so sick of this manna, we've lost our appetite for even what we've been complaining about. Can you imagine that you can complain so much that you don't even want what you've been complaining you don't have anymore, but you're still complaining? It's called kvetching. And you know they say that's good Jewish humor. Because a comedian, the old comedians used to kvetch, and there's an art to kvetching. Because even when you finally get what you're kvetching about, you start kvetching some more. Because now you've got to create something else because there's something about kvetching that gets us through our circumstances, right? But it doesn't get us to our destination, the destination we want. It just lets us romanticize the past and what we don't have. And even when we get what we finally want, we don't even realize it's, we, should, we don't have to complain anymore. So let's take a look at the prophet reading and look at 10 minutes of the Haftarah, the prophetic precepts starting with Isaiah 55 and verse number 3. It says, incline your ear and come to me. Now remember what Moses said, my, my, my teaching is going to come like rain. But he says, I'm going to open my mouth and speak. You need to listen. You need to hear the words that I'm about to speak. So look what Isaiah says. Incline your ear and come to me. Does that sound like our Messiah? Yes. Come to me. Are you weary and heavy laden? I'll give you rest. It says, come to me, listen to me, come to the water, come on and drink. Look what it says. It says, listen so that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the trustworthy loyalty of David. Actually, I, I meant to start at verse 1. I have my slides reversed. Look at verse 1. It says, ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come to where? The waters. What were they complaining about they didn't have? We have no water. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money. Remember they said, we used to have food for free when we were slaves. Really? And Isaiah said, no, you can still have it for free. Just come to the right source. And he says, milk and without money and without cost. Wine and milk. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? Your wages for what does not satisfy. Do you know what's so funny? People complain about not having enough food on the table, yep. can't pay their bills, but yet they can find themselves at the casino, uh -huh. hoping and wishing that they could take the rent money or the mortgage money and make more out of it. Like it's some kind of magical hocus pocus, like, wow, well, I know I'm real close. I feel that itchy finger. Come on, I got that itch. I know, I, I got it. No, that itch is an addiction. That's <laughs> what it is. It's an addiction that you can take your whole check. It was meant to pay for what you say you already don't have enough money for. Because right. you might be living beyond your means, or you might just be having a hard situation, either one. But you're already hurting. And now you're going to spend what you already say you don't have enough of? On what magically might appear like turning stones to bread? <laughs> Think about it. You can't magically change your situation, but you can start making new decisions for your future. So look what, look what it says. It says, listen diligently to me and eat. Then we go to incline your ear, come to me, listen. And I love the fact that it's a, a covenant that God made with David also. Now, let's jump ahead to the, to the Psalms, which are attributed to King David. And let's go ahead and look at Psalm 78, 10 and see how it rehearses this whole wanderness, wilderness experience. 
this wandering wilderness experience. We see here, uh, verse 10 says, they did not keep God's what? Covenant. Covenant. And refused to walk in his Torah. Torah. That was the test. It was the test of the Torah. They forgot his deeds and his wonders that he had shown them. Look at verse 12. He did miracles in front of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the plain of Saon. He split the sea and led them through, and he made the what? Water stand like a wall. Remember, Miriam went through praising the Lord. By day, he led them with a cloud, and all night like, uh, with a light of fire, he split apart rocks in the what? In the wilderness. Verse 19 says, Then they spoke against God, saying, Can God set a table in the wilderness? Sure he can. What do you mean can God? When, when, can, when has there ever been a time that God said he, could, he was going to do something and he didn't do it? Now there's prophecy that is yet to come to pass. But everything God said he's going to do in the time he said he would do it, he did it. And the things are yet to happen, they're still yet to happen. But that's okay because he didn't put a time limit on those things. There are prophecies for future events for the latter days. Look what it says in verse 19 again. Can God set a table in the wilderness? That's their question. Questioning whether God can do it. See, he struck the rock, waters gushed out, streams overflowed. But he can but can he give water? So yeah, he uh, excuse me, can he give bread? He gave us water, yeah, yeah, I know that story. But can he give bread? Well think about it. If he said he'd give you water, and he did, and he said he'd give you bread, then why don't you trust him that he'll do it like he said he would do? Because whatever he said he'll do, whatever he spoke, he'll bring it to pass. God's not a liar. So if he gave you water, why don't you trust him for the bread? Right? So he says, yeah, see, he struck the rock, water's gushed out, streams overflowed, but can he give bread? Will he provide meat for his people? So now, look at water, bread, meat. Say it with me. Water, bread, meat. Now, let's take a look at uh, Psalm 23, verse number 5. Because I think this is really... Amazing that when you look at the questions they had, David had already an answer for Israel's question in his psalm, the 23rd psalm, that we love to sing a lot. Look what it says in verse number 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. The rabbis say this is referring to the abundance of that we should have, that not only should our table be set, but our cup should be overflowing. Amen. So it's amazing on the closing of Shabbat, we always let our cup of joy overflow into our work week because we separate in Havdalah, the separation of the Sabbath from the six days, of, six days of the work week. But we let the cup overflow into the plate so that it represents a cup that overflows, like David said. Yeah. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Right. The priest was anointed with oil, his cup would overflow as a drink offering. And what was on that table is not just a drink offering, but was bread. And there were 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was called the table of showbread. And where was that table of showbread? In the wilderness. So can God provide a table in the wilderness? Yes. yes. He already has. He gave the instruction for the table before they even set out on their journey. They made all these vessels, and then they carried these vessels from place to place. So in their 40 years, God always had a table in the midst of a wilderness. And it didn't matter where they were at. There's always a table. And there was always fresh bread. It was so important that the bread was fresh that priests had to remove the previous bread from the previous week. Two priests would bring fresh bread. And two other priests would simultaneously move the old bread off so that the table never missed having bread on it. So it's kind of like this. The two would be taking up, they'd be like this, waiting, like, okay, quick. Same time, bring the bread, quick. Like a magic trick. You know, you take the tablecloth and the plates are still on. It was like you never missed a beat. The old bread taken off, the new bread in. Guess what? The old bread was eaten by the priest who still tasted fresh as if it was brand new fresh bread. Because the show bread lasted for seven days. But the manna only lasted for a day. Five days of daily bread, as Yeshua taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. But on the sixth day, a double portion, so they didn't have to pick manna on the Sabbath. You only have six days 
of morning manna. That's why I give you six days of morning manna to, to think about, meditate on. Right. How many actually got a chance to read some of your morning manna this week? Okay, a few of you got a chance to read it. It's online now uh, on our website, and I post it on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So great resource for you to use. Now, think of the New Covenant when you look at the Breed Hadashah as we close our time today and look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. It says, for though by this time you ought to be what? Teachers, Teachers Torah scholars. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. What were the first principles of the oracles of God? That ten commands or words that we call the Decalogue in Greek, or Aseret Hadibrot, or Hadvarim, we say the ten words in Hebrew, whether we use the masculine or the feminine form, usually the feminine form is referring to something receptive, the way a, a husband receives a wife, he receives her, so you receive the Torah, so they call it Aseret, which is ten, Hadibrot, which is the word Devar in the feminine form, because it's words like the Torah, feminine, to be received. Technically, it should be Devarim, like the book is named Devarim, words. But purposefully, like a covenant to a bride, a marriage vow covenant, they put it in the feminine form, rabbinically. So it's called Aseret Habibrot, the ten words. Now, look what it, it's referring to. It says you need someone to go back and teach you the top ten again. You need the first top ten basics. Go back and study. Think about this statement from the writer of Hebrews. By this time, as much as you've been learning and journeying with the Lord, you should be teachers by now. Yeah. But you've got to have someone go back and teach the basics. Do you know it's sad that the body of Messiah needs to go back to the basics? Mm -hmm. We should be able to, as the writer also said, move beyond the basic principles sure. of salvation and immersion and judgment, laying on of hands and all these basic principles in Hebrews chapter 6. He says, I you can't do that. So you need to go back to the basics. You need to learn the first principles. You know what we're, we're saying to the nations? We need to go back and study the Torah. Right. Because the Torah is the foundation of the prophets, and the prophets, the foundation for the new covenant. Right. Everything's built upon the Torah and the prophets. Everything. Amen. Starting with the Torah. Yeah. And I love the way it refers to it as milk, because the rabbis refer to it as milk. And you have need, uh, you have come to need milk and not solid food. So here you have something very important to understand. The prophet said you can have wine and milk, not pay a dime. Yep. And this is an allusion to the baby who's newborn needing mother's milk to build up the immunity against the enemies that attack its body so that it's strong when sickness and disease comes. So think of mother's milk. Think about David that says, I humble myself like I'm drawn from the breast and weaned from the milk. I humble my soul. I don't take on matters too big for me. So in the beginning, start with the basics. Don't take on anything too big for you. You know, you want to learn Hebrew, okay? Don't, don't sign up to talk to an Israeli and do this online thing when you don't know the basic concepts. Because what will happen is you'll get lost with that Israeli uh, accent and you're going to like, I can't even understand the person that I'm paying for to be my teacher. Start with the basics. Start at your shul and learn Hebrew here. And as you get more advanced, then start doing more advanced studies and doing conversational Hebrew. But you got to start with the basics. Guess what? Some of you, uh, it might just be the basics of learning the Hebrew words in our songs. Right. What if every time we sang a song, you go, I gotta write that word down. What was that one word we were saying? Hey, Rabbi, I heard us sing that one word. What does that word mean? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let's talk about that word. You know, actually, what I want to do today, if there's a topic that you want to study that we have not talked about, I want you to anonymously put on a piece of paper and put it in the Sadaka box. But I want you to put it in this one over here. Okay. Once you put it in this sadaka box over here, if you have anything that you're saying, I need revelation on. Uh, we study a lot of things here at the shul, but there's some things that maybe we haven't touched. And you want to study. It might even be something from a very Christian concept, and you want to understand it from a Jewish perspective. I want you to take this revelation you're getting today about praying for that manna from heaven, mm -hmm. and place your request, instead of complaining about it, Let's start seeking the Lord for it. Amen? Yes. Let's say, God, what do you want us to learn? We're in a new season at the synagogue. We're trying to learn some new things. So let's do that today and go back to the basics. Let's get that milk we need. Because eventually, milk leads to the bread, bread leads to the meat, the meat right? 
And so we see in verse 13, it says, For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, but he's a babe. But solid food, meaning meat, belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Think about what the Torah is for, to help you discern between good and evil, right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness. What God calls blessed and what God calls cursed. What God calls clean and what God calls unclean. Guess what? It's just basic principles. But we got to get the basics before we can see how that all relates to Messiah. Amen. The meat of it is Messiah. Messiah is the meat. Amen. That doesn't mean stick in the New Testament all day. Because the concept is to eat the full meal. Amen. Not just to get part of your meal. Because even just eating too much meat can just sit in your stomach like, Oh my God, all that meat. I can't digest all this meat. you got to eat meat with the vegetables and with the bread. You need a balanced diet. That's why we try to balance the Torah, the prophets, the writings, and the Brit Havashah. Guess what? We can see that in the life of Messiah, Messiah had to learn to discern between even good and evil, because he himself was tempted as we are tempted, as it says in Matthew 4.1. Then Yeshua led by the Ruach, the Spirit, into the what? Wilderness. Where were the Israelites? In, in the wilderness. To be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, how long did Moses fast? Four days and 40 nights. How many times? Twice. At least twice that we can verify. Rabbis say maybe even a third time. And it says, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, just like Moses, and he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are Ben Elohim, son of God, guess what? Tell these stones to become bread. Change your reality. Be your own dictator of your own destiny. And he replied, wait a minute, in the Torah it's written, <laughs> man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that, that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. That was Deuteronomy 8.3. So the very passage we read about the manna in relationship to the Torah, Messiah is saying, don't you know that it is written in the Torah, which is really my bread that I've been eating on for 40 days and 40 nights? I've been meditating on the Torah because that's all. Messiah had was the Torah and the prophets, but he had to go from what he learned as a child because he didn't have a Torah scroll up there in the wilderness. He had to have it in his mind. Guess where the temptation was also taking place? In his mind. Because he was being told to throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. They were miles away from the temple. But the temptation was happening in his mind. Where does your temptation happen? In your mind. And look what uh, Revelation 2, 17 says as I start to land this plane. Look at Revelation 2.17. He who has an ear, let him what? Hear. hear. So Moses told us to hear. Isaiah told us to hear. Yeshua told us to hear. Now John, the disciple of Yeshua, is telling us that Yeshua is saying, hear. Because this is Yeshua talking through uh, John the Apostle. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach is saying to Messiah's community. To the one who overcomes... I will give some of the hidden manna. Now, this is important. You get daily manna, right? You might even get a double portion. But when you come to the house of God for the showbread, there's some hidden manna in the Holy Holies. It's hidden in the Ark of the Covenant. So yes, I don't give you the manna, I show you the bread. But if I show you the bread, God says, I'll give you the hidden manna. Manna that was kept, watch this, one bowl of manna kept in the Ark of the Covenant that never perished. It never turned to worms. Their manna, their revelation was only daily, so you can't live off yesterday's manna. Right. You can't live off of yesterday's prayer or revelation. Yesterday's worship ain't good. It has a 24-hour expiration date. It will expire. And if you don't get more manna, so will you. Because whatever manna Yeshua got in the morning, morning manna, right? In the morning, there was the manna, right? Guess what? The enemy came in the afternoon to tempt. So sometimes we don't overcome temptation because we didn't get our morning manna because the manna is to prepare us for the temptation. Think about this. Messiah was eating morning manna called the Torah. Rain from heaven, right? Yes. That's why he didn't need physical food because he was eating spiritual food, the revelation of the Torah, the manna from heaven. In fact, he says, I am the true manna. Right? So this is beautiful. If the meat... Or the substance of the revelation from heaven is about Messiah. 
and the Torah leads us to Messiah, then the revelation of the manna is Messiah himself. Because technically, the manna came from heaven, as the Torah came from heaven, as Messiah came from heaven. And so we see that the word made flesh is the Torah made flesh and dwelt among us. It's the manna from heaven. Look what it says. I'll give you hidden manna, and I will give you a white stone, and written on the stone a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Uh, a lot about that, but it's funny how Peter was called a stone. And he was a building block in the temple. You know, the cornerstone sometimes would have an honorary name to who it was, uh, the, the building was being built for. And so can you imagine a cornerstone with Messiah's name in it, Yeshua? But you also have your name written in it. Because when you look in Revelation, and you see the New Jerusalem, guess what? Twelve foundations, which are the twelve tribes. I mean, of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And then the twelve pearly gates with their names written in the stone. Are the twelve tribes of Israel. So think about you being a stone in the building and your name is written in that new stone. Praise the Lord. You're one of God's building blocks. You are lively stones, living stones, Peter says, just like Messiah called Peter a living stone. And he says, I'll put your, you'll have a new name on it. Thank God your old name's not on there. And finally, I'll close with John 6, 20, uh, 29. It says, Yeshua answered them, this is the work of God to trust in the one he sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you perform so that we may believe, that we may see and believe you? What work do you do? Our fathers ate the manna where? In the wilderness, meaning do a miracle like Moses did. As it is written, out of heaven he gave them bread to eat. Notice it says, he gave them bread to eat. Look at verse 32. Yeshua answered them, Amen, amen, I tell you. It isn't Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So wait a minute, what they were saying is, do a miracle like Moses, because Moses gave us some bread. So you give us bread, because if you're the new Moses, the prophet like unto Moses, give us a miracle like he did. And Yeshua is reminding them that it wasn't Moses that did the miracle. The miracle came through Moses, but it came from God. Amen. The supply comes through us, but the source is still God. Amen. Right? And so it says that the Father gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one coming down from heaven, giving life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread from now on. Meaning, if that's the case, give us this bread that doesn't perish from now on. Amen. Kind of like the manna in the uh, Holy of Holies in the ark. Look at 30, uh, verse 35. Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever believes in me will never be what? Thirsty. Notice hunger and thirst. Remember the bread, the water. We also had meat. Verse 45 says, It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Wait a minute, I thought Moses taught them. No, but they were taught by God. Well, I thought Messiah taught them in the first century. Yes, but they were taught by God through Messiah. Yeah. I didn't come to do my own work, Messiah said. I came to do the work of my Father. So notice he says, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened and learned from the Father comes to me. So in other words, if you're learning from God, you'll come to me because I'm speaking the words of God. Yeah. God is my Father, so you'll come to me because my Father is giving you the true bread. But you'll come to me to get the bread. Yeah. Yeah. So when a Jewish person realized, just as they depended upon Moses to receive the bread, because he's the one that declared to him that, that, that God was raining down, raining down manna from heaven, in the same way a Jewish person needs to believe in Messiah, that he is giving them the bread of our Heavenly Father, Avinu, our King, our Father, our King. And the Bible says they trusted in God and his prophet Moses. Guess what we need to do today? Trust in God and his prophet Yeshua, who is the Messiah. Amen. Do you receive that today? Four things I want you to walk away with about this menu is, number one, it's Hashem that rains down the Torah to satisfy our hunger. It's, it's Hashem that rains down the Torah. It wasn't Moses. Moses didn't give us the Torah. He delivered it like the waiter. But the cook... In the kitchen is the Father. Amen. Come on, I'm going to have to say it again. You see, Moses was like the waiter serving them the Torah. 
like bread out of the oven, but the source is the baker. Amen? Amen. Hashem rains down the Torah to satisfy our hunger. He, Hashem also pours out His Spirit to quench our thirst. Aren't you glad that we have the Holy Spirit to teach us the Torah? Because the law without the Spirit is not good, and the Spirit without the law is not good. But in fact, we need the Spirit of the law to be in our hearts, to write the commandments on the tablets of our heart. Number three, Hashem feeds us with the meat when we are ready to be mature. If you're not mature, you're not going to get the meat. Meat is only for mature people. You know, for my, for my daughter, for, for, for a long time, she didn't like meat. She just wanted, you know, she loved her carbohydrates. She loved her vegetables and loved her fruit. And uh, I'll never forget the time that we ever, you know, we put in front of her some nuggets. And so she tear up on those things. She didn't know what it was. What is this? It's like manna, ma manhu. <laughs> mahu, what is it, right? So she's tearing up on these nuggets. And all of a sudden, someone said, oh, your daughter's eating chicken nuggets. And she said, chicken? <laughs> and on Sesame Street was a chicken, and she was sitting in her high chair watching that chicken and eating the chicken, and she said, chicken nuggets? And all of a sudden, she was afraid to eat nuggets anymore. And she found out they were chicken nuggets. And she was eating Sesame Street's little chicken. We can't do that. And then one day, she matured and got older. She goes, Daddy, guess what? I'm older now. I can eat chicken nuggets. <laughs> And then she took a little piece of salmon off my plate from the grill and she goes, guess what daddy, I'm old enough, I can have salmon now. Oh. And guess what she did, well, we took the roast of the beef out of the oven and she, you know, we had torn a piece of meat that had meat on my plate and potatoes, a whole bit of asparagus to make you hungry, I know. And um, she said, daddy, guess what, I can have beef too, I can have that too. I'm like, why, why is that? Because I'm old enough now. Isn't it amazing that sometimes we have to make a declaration that we're old enough now that we deserve to have these things we've been depriving ourselves of? And why go thirsty? Why go hungry? Why be lonely? Why not have a family, a mishpoka that you can go? Be a kind of person that makes a declaration. Guess what? I'm mature enough now. I can handle the truth. I can handle the love. I can handle the fellowship. I can even handle the struggle. Because I'm mature enough now. If you're mature enough, you'll get the meat. And lastly, guess what? For the mature, Hashem reveals the hidden manna of Messiah to overcomers of the world's wilderness experience. How many know this world is a wilderness? But if we're mature enough to handle what God is feeding us, we'll become overcomers. Because when you eat the meat, it makes you strong. And you know what the young men do? They eat the meat of the word. And the Bible says they're strong and they overcome the wicked one. Aren't you glad the Messiah overcame the wicked one? And if he's an overcomer, that makes you and I an overcomer. Let's stand to our feet today and thank God for this wonderful uh, teaching today. Did you get something out of the message? Yes. Amen. Amen. I pray that we have a really good week today as we stretch our hands for the blessing. Let's stretch it towards heaven because he's the source. We have the supply, but he's the source. Yivarachacha Adonai v'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai p'nav elecha v'yuneka Yisa Adonai p'nav elecha v'yasev lecha Shalom Amen May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you, shine your face upon you, be gracious to you, lift up your countenance upon you, and give you his perfect peace from the Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom, Yeshua HaMashiach. In his name we pray, Bishim Yeshua. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.